Welcome to the show. I'm Jason Whitlock, and I'll tell you why Dak Prescott has become the voice of reason on the national anthem. And I'm Colin Coward, and I'll tell you why Charles Barkley sounds pretty jealous of LeBron James. Speak for yourself starts now. I don't know, petty or pretty jealous? jealous. Kind of sounds. How about honest? Have you ever heard the word honest? All right, hello and welcome. We're joined now by former NFL head coach Eric Mangini and Fox Sports College football reporter Bruce Feldman. Let's start today with some shocking allegations against Urban Meyer, who has been accused of lying about what he knew about assistant Zach Smith's history of domestic violence. Smith was fired last week after reporter Brett McMurphy revealed that the coach had a pattern of abuse against his ex-wife, Courtney. At the time of that report, Meyer was asked what he knew about Smith's situation, and here's what he had to say. Well, I am going to address the 2009 because I've been asked about that. 2009, Zach was an intern, a, a very young couple. As I do any time that I imagine most coaches or people in leadership positions, you receive a phone call, first thing you do is tell your boss, uh, let the experts do their jobs. Uh, we're certainly not going to investigate. It came back to me that what was reported wasn't actually what happened. And so uh, Shelly and I actually both got involved because of our relationship with that family and um, advised for counseling and wanted to help as we move forward. 2015, I got a text late last night that something happened in 2015 and uh, there was nothing uh, unless, once again, there's nothing. You know, once again, I don't know who creates a story like that. And then this recent one was, uh, you know, you press pause. It's something our team lives by, E plus R equals O. You get an event, you press pause, get your mind right and step up. Press pause to gather information, uh, get your mind right to gather energy, and, and then step up to do the right thing. That's uh, the position that I hold, and that's why we did that. All right, but today McMurphy posted another article that included text messages from 2000, 2015 between Courtney and Meyer's wife, Shelley indicating that Meyer did know of the allegations at the time, with Courtney adding, quote, all the coaches' wives knew. Not only that, according to Courtney, Meyer's confidants pressured her not to press charges on the original incident all the way back in 2009. All right, Cowherd, let's ask the unfortunate, obvious question. Should Urban Meyer lose his job? Um, I, I think a strong suspension. Uh... If they don't have a connection between urban texting and uh, Courtney, I think it would be harder to fire him. Um, but I think if not legally, ethically, what's the standard? I mean, we, we, with all these coaches, they always seem to wiggle out of the, I didn't know. Forget legal for a second. Ethically, I think Urban Meyer has a huge responsibility as a collegiate coach. This is what I said about Patino. It's your job to know. These are the 18-year-olds, the first time they've ever been away from school, often in another state. You're part psychologist, part coach, part parent, part mentor. Ethically, there's a responsibility, and I think a, a at minimum, a strong suspension. I think in the current climate and environment that we have, uh, given what's happened at Michigan State, given what's happened at Baylor, I think it's going to be very hard for him to keep his job. And, and I wouldn't blame Ohio State if today or in the next 24, 48 hours they suspended him pending an investigation. And then after they do an investigation, they'll have a decision to make on Urban Meyer. You, Brett McMurphy's story uh, paints a pretty negative picture, particularly when you consider that at Florida, uh, Urban Meyer uh, had no problem having players with shady backgrounds on yes. his team, a yeah. lot of arrests on his team. And so when you have this assistant coach who is very, who's the grandson of Earl Bruce, who is Urban's mentor and other than his father, the closest man to him, it looks like Urban Meyer looked out for a guy uh, on his coaching staff over personal reasons and, and treated him in a way he perhaps wouldn't have another coach. Uh, th these situations are complicated, but in this society that we have right now and given the way these issues are being dealt with, I think Ohio State is in a position where they have to suspend him immediately, investigate, and perhaps move on from him. I don't know if they need to s suspend him immediately, but they, they need to figure out exactly what the truth is and, and these things are, are, are complicated and, and have layers. So to, to rush to judgment, I don't think that's fair either. And, and 
He talked about the 2009 incident. He said he was aware of it, but it ended up not being what it was presented as, and they, they had advocated for counseling, and, and the couple stayed together. So it's being in that position, you're brought a lot of different situations, and they're hard situations, and they're real situations, and you're trying to figure out what's right, what's, what's right for everybody involved, and what you try not to do is rush into a decision that you can't take back. And, and I think that's where we are now, is, is trying to find out what exactly happened before we rush to, to judgment. Well, a couple of things to keep in mind with this, because it's college athletics. With the gray area, as, as it relates to what Colin was saying, you got to keep in mind there's Title IX and there's the Cleary Act. So it's going to, Ohio State, as part of this investigation, which they're going to have to, to do some due diligence here, is what did he know? And what did he do about it? Where did it go? Now, he, he said in the clip we had in 2009, and I don't know if that meant he went up to Jeremy Foley, who would have been his boss at Florida with that, did he go anywhere with some of this other information? And I think when we saw the clip from last week at Big Ten Media Days, uh, you have a guy who speaks in such absolutes, and he said, well, we look, you know, I got a text about it last night. Well, from the text from Urban Meyer, as well as his director of football operations wife that Brett McMurphy had, had uh, reported on today, a lot of people knew there was something there. And maybe he's saying, well, there was nothing there, meaning there were no charges, because they had been looked on a couple times and there have been charges. You know, earlier today, uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer reported there were nine police reports between in the last six years between in this involving this couple. Wow. And so there's a lot of smoke around this. And I think not just what Urban Meyer says, but even the text message from, from his wife, Shelly, talking about he scares me. Those are pretty damning words to hang out there. And now the question is, how many people believe that uh, the director of football operations wife knew and Urban's wife knew and nobody told urban that he did that he didn't There's, know that's real you have to really suspend belief it, it comes down to like the sandusky joe paw 30 years together nobody talked i have a hard time believing that my, my issue one of the most concerning things to me is that earl bruce and urban meyer's life coach i can't think of the guy's name uh they went and talked to the woman and i think zach smith in 2009 so this is urban meyer's second father and his life Hiram coach, DeFries. yeah, Hiram DeFries, going to talk to Zach Smith in 2009. I'm just, and again, 2009, I'm not even sure if he, that was down in Florida, yes. if my so memory's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so just hearing that at Ohio State or wherever he's at now, that all sounds inappropriate to me. That it shouldn't be Earl Bruce and Urban Meyer's life coach, it should be some kind of trained professional going to send help to the wife, Courtney and getting to the bottom of it, not people, a grandfather with an invested interest and a life coach with an invested interest in Urban Meyer. I think those type things, that kind of bad judgment, I can't go all the way, but having been in a position where I was managing employees, there is some level of sympathy for Urban Meyer only because if, you, if we ever got to the real details of this, because we've heard Brett McMurphy's version and, and his source appears to be Courtney, I guarantee there are, there's more context than even we know about. And, and, and I, I've how, been... How, but how about Urban's reputation? Among coaches, among the sources I've had, his reputation at Florida was overly permissive. That program was a mess. He, he had what some thought was a physical mental breakdown at the end. He had lost weight. Uh, it was an exhausting program. And then, so, you know, we know that. That's rock solid. We know of the arrest. He took multiple gambles on players. Then he goes to Ohio State. We don't see the problems. But, you know, reputations matter. I was less worthy to trust, less willing to trust Patino because I thought he had been slick previously. When I hear this about Urban, I think, well, the Urban I know is a really great coach, but he's permissive. Well, I, I think what's changed, Colin, and I just being around Columbus this offseason, I think Urban Meyer has better kids at Ohio State than he did at Florida. You know, talking to people who were there at both places, they just said they've been able to recruit better kids, and they, I think they have a lot more. You know, so it's, it's created where you're not seeing the police blotter stuff. But the constant here, as you, as you alluded to, was he took, he took chances on really sh sketchy character guys. Well, on his staff, it wasn't the players who, who, who have caused this big problem. 
it was an assistant coach, and it was the guy, it was the grandson of his mentor. He's the one, and you hear more stories of some, some really sketchy behavior from this guy. You said nine police reports? Nine calls or whatever, because I think there were some calls where she said she hung up, things like that. But yes, this was an ongoing thing. And there's, there's a, a lot of college programs that are overly permissive. There's, there's a lot of NFL programs that have taken chances on guys, too. The thing where you look at it is if, if he felt there was something there in 2009, would he have brought this assistant coach to Ohio State? If he thought there was something really fundamentally wrong there, would, would he have done that? And that makes me, when, when he makes the comment that he, that he did, that, you know, after they investigated, that they, they didn't see anything. Now, now, that being said, you know, I also looked at this and, and tried to figure out, okay, what, what would be the best end goal for this situation? And, and uh, is, it, is it getting him help? Is it getting her to, to a different place? How does the losing the, the job affect the family? There, there's a lot of layers that you're, you're trying to, to, to dig through in all of this. Hey, Eric, one thing that you're getting at that I'll, I'll go all the way there is we're looking to Urban Meyer for solutions. And I've read the story, and this is why I'm saying there's more to the story. I, I want to know more about her parents, his parents, the, because Urban Meyer, to me, is easy to figure out. He's about winning, he's about money, he's about protecting his reputation. We see this over and over again in college athletics. And there's been so much money poured into the college athletics and that eliminates a lot of integrity in my opinion. People are so driven by money and the system is so exploitive in my opinion that I think it justifies breaches in character and integrity like we've seen from Urban Meyer, but, but in, in this situation, we think. But, but again, I'll say we're going to probably vilify Urban Meyer. Uh, it's going to happen over social media, and he'll deserve some of that, I think, depending on how this investigation goes. But, but I, I just think there's more to the story in terms of college athletics and the system of coaches making eight, nine, ten million dollars are we not thinking, and uh, this guy was a position coach making $350,000. Are, are we not thinking about what all that money does to people's integrity, and do they move away from the actual reasons why they got into coaching to instill values in young people? Because that's what I look at with this assistant coach. How could he be trusted to instill the right value? He can't control himself. Well, I, he... and I, and I, but I, I, I go back, let's just talk about the specifics in this case. This is Art Bryles, Rick Pitino, Urban Meyer, Joe Paterno. I have to believe in all four cases that coaches' wives don't talk to coaches, that coaches down the hall in the cubicle next door, 70 hours a week for eight years, don't talk to coaches. That you, you are, that's, like a, that's like a bad movie script. I mean, I, in, I was supposed to believe Sandusky, 30 years, nobody talked. Art Bryles, Baylor, nobody talked. Here's, Everybody talks. Gossip is in every cubicle in America. Here's my point, though, Colin, why I believe, and Bruce, maybe you, you can respond, why I believe the college system has to change to some degree. Urban Meyer is not equipped to deal with this issue, period. He is a football coach. He has no clue what to do. That's how Earl Bruce and his life coach ended up in the middle of this. And so if I'm a college or an institution, I got to put someone into my athletic systems where all this money's being exchanged who actually have but Jason, expertise that stuff, that issues. is the, like when I mentioned Title IX and the Cleary Act, there's a Title IX office. They put that in place. And so it's not this, it, it, believe me, I'm not a big NCAA fan, but it's not the system's fault in this place. The coaches are, as you said, the coaches are not the expert. They are not supposed to know how to handle this. Baylor was not supposed to be playing judge, jury, and executioner with these kids. It is supposed to be, as soon as you hear something, whether you believe it's true or it's complete you know, nonsense, you're supposed to go up the food chain and go to the Title IX office and let them deal with it. And so when this stuff starts to happen, how insulated were they? And that comes back to who knew what, when, and what did they do about it? It's not just what did you know it's, and when did you know it, it's also what did you do about it? And that's where I think they're, they're at risk. And Bruce, I don't know this, and I'm glad you raised the point, but I'm talking about right in those football coaching offices, there need to be people 
that are just looking out for the best interests of the kids and anybody else right in the same offices with the same access to the kids, the coaches, and everybody else. It can't be in some far off building where they keep everything in football a secret and these people have no eyes and ears and you're waiting on someone to manage it up to you, you need to be right there on the ground floor. It's a it's a really messy structure the way it is, and I think we're seeing this for the last decade. We saw it completely overrun at Baylor, and again, I mean, you introduced another point of this, which is you have, you know, that expression, absolute power corrupts absolutely. You're talking about people who are making well into seven figures, but again, it's like, I don't think this was out of, out of money. I think, if anything, where he erred is out of just loyalty to this guy who had been the mentor, this grandson oh, of his mentor, and if that's where he's given him the benefit of the doubt, that's where I think he's, gonna, he's getting him in trouble. Welcome back, Eric Mangini's back. We're now joined by former pro bowler T.J. Hushmanzada. Let's move to the National Football League where every first round pick from this year's draft has signed their rookie deals, except for one, Chicago linebacker Roquan Smith from Georgia. He's holding out over language in his contract that would void his guaranteed money if he's suspended, with a rookie concerned that he could be unfairly suspended under the league's confusing new helmet contact rule. Whitlock is the young, young man making a mistake. No, I, I don't think so at all. I, I think this is great and bold, and I was very happy with this morning when our producers, you know, pointed direct to me on this story, because I, I don't understand how this isn't being talked about. Everybody's confused about this new helmet rule. There's gonna, there's gonna be suspensions that could end up costing people money, and, and I'm sitting there as, as a football fan, and then if I'm a football player, there's this rule coming out that could cost a lot of defensive players, and hell, even some offensive players, their money, and no one's talking about this other than Rokon Smith and his agent. Where's DeMora Smith in the NFL PA on this? Well, this, I agree with you. There's something happening in the NFL right now. We're seeing massive rule changes due to safety, and players are saying, time out, time out, time out. So we're having massive rule changes, and you want me to sign just a template contract. I'm not doing it. Yeah. By the way, in our business, there were no podcasts 10 years ago. There was no digital 15 years ago. You used to just sign a contract. Okay, I'll be on TV or radio. Doesn't work that way anymore. I got to get a piece of this and a piece of that and a piece of this. When rules change, when landscapes change, when cultures change, when laws change, the athlete has a right to go, I want a piece of this revenue. I don't want to get dinged for that revenue. Let me tell you something. This, this was Sam Darnold. Sam Darnold wasn't holding out for money. He was holding out for language. And when rules and sports change, I'm with the player doing it. Demora Smith is out fighting for the national anthem while guys are potentially <laughs> losing money. I, I completely understand why an organization would fight for, for certain protections in any contract. And every organization is different in terms of fundamentally what they believe in. And, and they hold the line on that. On this one, though, it, it's hard to get behind it. I heard that they, they had this in, in other contracts where, where guys have accepted it but said, well, we won't, reinforce, we won't enforce it if it happens. So to me, if you're not going to enforce it when it happens, why do you hold the line on it? And in a landscape where the rules are changing and nobody knows how it's going to be, uh, how it's going to affect people, why not try to come to a compromise of if it becomes a, a problem three, four, five times, that's where it kicks in as opposed to a... But you're saying basically you're okay with some ambiguity in it. You've had owners lie to you. Like, if I'm a player, an owner can own for 100 years, right? He can pass it on to his kids and his family. I'm a player. I got eight years. You, you ding me once, twice. I'm losing generational money that I can never get. I don't trust the, money. I don't yeah. trust the owner. I'm a player. Put, they need to put language in a contract that says if you're suspended for any of these rule changes that have taken place, we can't go after your money. I mean, honestly, the Chicago Bears are idiots. You don't draft a guy in the top ten and how go over this, and he's unsigned, in this day and age where everybody's contract is, is slotted. I mean, they're, they're being idiotic. It makes no sense for them to do this to this young man when if he gets suspended for lowering his helmet, you want to take away his guarantees. That makes no sense. Put language in the contract that if he's suspended, even if it is four or five, six times, if he's suspended for playing football for rules that he's going to have to adapt and change and he's been playing it his whole life, that's going to be hard to do. But, but TJ, just th I think there are guys that have signed these contracts without putting a thought into it, Man. the Rokon Smith. And, and just think about, take a James Harrison. The, the rules of the NFL changed on him in real time. 
and hits that he used to be celebrated for, and we we that jacked up, and we'd celebrate it. The next thing you know, that was costing him fifty thousand every if time he did if that's, that. If that's the case, those dudes need to fire their agents asap. Also, asap, it, it because has to he be, has somebody looking okay. after him. Last five years, we couldn't figure out a catch. Do we really believe their officials have this buttoned up? I mean, I'm listening yesterday to somebody talk about this rule change defensively. Fifteen minutes into the conversation, I was more confused as a listener to the rule than I was going into it. So I don't think the referees... I, this, these aren't pilots in a cockpit where you have to pass a test or you can't fly. This is, on, this is a fast-moving sport. It's on the fly. Again, ambiguities everywhere on this stuff. I just watched catches confuse refs for a decade. Uh, this is going to be clean? I don't think this is going to be clean. I, th I do think the ambiguity plays to, to, to the players' approach on this. However, if, the, if this is, is something that each side is going to dig in on and days are going to go by, if you could get to some point of compromise where it happens over and over again, whatever that number is, and everybody can feel good about it, then, then at least we can get him into camp. He needs to be in, in But you're going to you're going to have this young man, he's going to miss tackles, he's not going to make the plays he should make because he's concerned about getting suspended. He's concerned about losing his money. This should not be in the contract at all because he's not going to play to the level he's capable of playing because, oh, man, I'm at suspension number three. If I get to four, some... He'll miss tackles. All, but, but he may miss tackles, but if you're not playing, if you're suspended, you can't make any tackles. I, I agree, but all of this, the changing of the game this dramatically, this on a whim, just seems crazy to me. If you're going to do this with the tackle, why didn't you test it out someone? I know you don't have NFL Europe anymore, but you got to test it out somewhere. Ask some uh, spring football colleges to test it out during the spring. <laughs> They're just doing this on the fly, changing the rules and the nature of the game. And I agree with TJ. The, 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 you play for the money at this level, particularly knowing the health risk. And now guys are like, oh, if I do something that I have been doing, it could cost me money? You're not going to do it. There you go. You're not going to do it. All right, welcome back. Eric Mangini, TJ Hushmanzada are back. Let's move to Dallas, where apparently Dak Prescott is facing some backlash on social media for supporting the Cowboys' policy that everyone stand for the national anthem, even going so far as to say he preferred real action to kneeling. But despite the criticism, Dak is standing his ground, saying, quote, I never said I didn't believe in social injustice and things that were going on. I just said I didn't think that the national anthem was the time. It's two minutes out of our day that we could also be spending embracing what our country should be and what our country is going to be one day that we know that it is not right now. I am for the action. I am for joining Malcolm Jenkins and joining those guys and doing something different. That is what I mean my taking that next step rather than just kneeling or standing. Cowherd, do you think most players feel the same way as Dak Prescott? Yeah, and I think what Dak is doing is why I like Dak. I've never been blown away by his arm, his size. I like him because he's smart and he's a leader. This is what leaders do. They don't let Twitter influence their opinion. Dak's like, I said it. It's my opinion. You don't have to agree with me. That's what leaders do. Followers go on social media and join the avalanche. Leaders go on social media, have a conviction, and are not influenced by you not liking their opinion. Dak's not on Twitter all day. He's running a franchise. By the way, you'll notice about all the anthem stuff, the stars aren't talking about it. It is overwhelmingly marginal players who don't have as much to lose. Bree Dak's not talking about it. Breeze isn't talking about it. Matt Ryan's not talking about it. Luke Keekley's not talking about it. Most players aren't. So... You know, I mean, to me, this is why I like Dak. It's unpopular, but frankly, he's putting in 75 hours a week. I want him to worry about football during the season, and then if he's got an off day, worry about social causes. It, it, it's, it's really what my respect for Dak is growing just because I think this takes a tremendous amount of courage. Uh, I think most people are silent on this issue because they just don't want the hassle of the, hassle of the social media backlash. But I think Dak Prescott speaks for 97% of the players. Uh, and, and I think there's a loud minority on social media and a handful of NFL players and DeMora Smith 
who are pushing this because it's good for their brand building. It's good chaos, keeps them in the news. But Dak Prescott has stepped out here on a limb and been a real leader. I hope other guys follow in behind him because he's just talking common sense. Take action. Gestures just aren't nearly as important as people think, particularly when you're talking about multimillionaires in the NFL. They need to be beyond gestures. John Carlos and Tommy Smith. And LeBron James yesterday. Yeah, They're LeBron James. Yeah. But, but you go all the way back to the guys in the 60s, they weren't millionaires. Gestures is what they could afford to do. When you're a millionaire, you can afford to do more. And I think it is indicative of, of how guys feel where they put in all this time and effort and work to get to the point where they're about to play a game. And, and from a coaching perspective, you want that unity. You've got the diverse population in the locker room. You're trying to bring everybody together. And when you insert politics or religion or any of those different things at a moment right before you're trying to be unified, it's disruptive. And, and guys, I would imagine, would like the opportunity to say, okay, I'm just going to focus on the, on the task at hand. So it goes back to what we discussed uh, last week. Jerry Jones has shown he's had his players back. And so Dak Prescott is saying, we got your back. This, this is a problem. You, you gave a coach's perspective. You guys gave me this perspective. I'll, I can give a player's perspective, a black player's perspective. It's unpopular for Dak to do what he did because in the locker room and in our culture, you looked as a sellout. Right. Like, really, bruh? Like, you really going to come out and say this? And so to do what he did takes a ton of courage because in our culture, the black culture, it's like, you, you a sellout. Like, you really not going to follow us and join us in this? Our that's just how we are. I don't know why. But to enact change, it, number one, guys ain't kneeling. They do not want to kneel and lose their livelihood over something. If you really want to make change, you're going to get out there and you can't help everybody. You, you nail, there's still going to be police brutality. It's going to happen. It's not going to stop anything. People looked at what Dak did and they didn't like it because in our community, he's a sellout. And, and, and that's, that, that's the thing that takes so much courage By because the way, he knows he was going to get that backlash. By the way, Russell Wilson has faced some pushback in Seattle because he's thought of as a little sellout. He's about the league. He's about the franchise. But in the end, look at Seattle. Bennett's gone. Sherman's gone. Who's still standing? Russell Wilson. Sometimes the guy that's viewed as a sellout in any community just takes a stand that isn't popular. But who's left standing years later? Russell Wilson's left in Seattle, the sellout. But, but I'll say what Dak is pointing to and what LeBron James just did and what Jalen Rose did and what David Robinson did, taking their wealth and investing in black people. And so we call it selling out, but what Dak is trying to do is buy in. Yeah. He's trying to take his wealth that they achieve and use it to actually benefit people and that perhaps, and maybe I got a bias, but the, perhaps the people doing the, the millionaires doing the gestures are the sellouts in my view, as opposed to guys like LeBron, Jalen Rose, other guys that are using their wealth properly to benefit others. That's what millionaires do. That's you, hard. Yeah. That but, takes time and effort and money and financing. And what LeBron did yesterday is hard. Yeah. I mean, I, Colin Kaepernick basically lost his entire livelihood because this wasn't thought through and he'll never play football again. Uh, well, it's not just random fans that have gone after Dak over his stance. Fellow players calling out the Cowboy quarterback, including Raider linebacker Tier Whitehead, who tweeted, quote, sounds like Dak don't want to lose that Campbell's chunky soup deal. Whitlock, do you think this lingers over Dak all season? Unfortunately, again, I, I do believe what Dak has done is courageous, but I do think it's going to linger over him, and I think it puts more pressure on him. And, and he needs to perform at a high level because, and again, I don't think it's with the great mass. I think it's with this very vocal minority over social media that the, re the mainstream media is addicted to. We're going to amplify their voice. But you got to say this about Dak. Romo controversy didn't stick to him. Jerry's work didn't stick to him. Zeke controversy didn't stick to him. This kid has, I saw Kevin Sumlin last week, and I said, you know, I really whiffed on him. And Kevin Sumlin goes, so did I. He goes, 
I said, what is it about Dak? And he says, smart. And I start talking. He goes, no, no, he's just smart. Dak is a CEO. This is what Russell Wilson is. This is what the great ones are. Stuff doesn't stick to him. Dak has been swimming for two years around allegations, Zeke, Jerry, Anthem. None of it sticks. Because when I think of Dak Prescott, I just think of two words. Leadership. Football. And that, I think he's a very unique, special person. He is above the some players, and I can't explain it. They're above there's, the chaos. There's risk here, though, Colin. This is a racial component. And again, I think the media will amplify the voices of the negative if he doesn't play well. If he plays well, the sky's the limit. He will be, everybody's going to embrace him, and he's going to feel like a superhero. You know, I just wonder if to hear would have taken such a strong stance if he was on the Cowboys roster. Like of he's not, not. He's not being affected by, by those comments. He's not in the same situation that, that, that Dak is in. And look, Dak, one of the great things about this whole debate is everybody has a chance to express their opinion. And Dak is expressing his opinion. And I would like to think that people would respect that just like you, you respect the people who have decided to take a knee. That's, that's what this is all about, right? The ability to, to, to be able to express and have freedom uh, of expression. He, he's going to, every game he plays, guys are going, they're going to sack him. They'll get him to the ground. Somebody will whisper something in his ear. That, that's going to happen throughout the course of the season. It, it's unfortunate because it goes back to what I said last segment was the black athlete, they just going to give him a hard time for it. And why would he want to lose his uh, Campbell's? Of course. Why, why would he? I wouldn't. Like, why would he want to lose but, it? But, TJ, let's, let's be real. Go inside the locker room. What percentage of a 53-man roster will have a problem with Dak said? Two or three guys, in my opinion. If, if that. And with him being the quarterback of the team, as you know, nobody... Even in the opposing but, locker room. In no, Philadelphia's not, locker room. Not, not many. Right. Not many because it's... It's not like he's going against it. He's just saying, I'm not taking the knee now. I'll get out there and actually put my feet on the ground and try to help and change. Yeah, he's out and offering so, a solution. So I find a hard, like, I'm surprised Whitehead has a problem with it because he's pointed out, I'll get out there and help, but I'm not taking a knee. By the way, NBA players have always gotten shoe deals and endorsements. I can remember the first time I saw an NFL player. It was Donovan McNabb had a chunky soup, and I was like, wow, NFL guys now getting... NFL players deep down want to be NBA players. They do. They're jealous of their money and guaranteed contracts. So Dak comes in, gets a commercial as a kid, and you're banging on him. You NFL guys are... I heard a line from a coach once. He said, all NFL guys are frustrated basketball players. <laughs> they don't want to get hit, and they want to get paid forever. Players should be supporting Dak. He has a transcendent potential career. He's playing on the Cowboys. If he plays well, he's putting himself in position to be a huge endorser, brand endorser. 15 years. Make the kind of money that LeBron James is making or, you know, somewhere in that headed that direction. And then he's talking about using his money to help people the same as LeBron James. To hear White is just stupid in these comments. And he doesn't have starter money right now. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean... It, it, he needs the ass. He makes he, about he, $11 million off the field. I mean, it, yeah. Right. It, it, Nobody's it, trying to lose a sponsorship and lose money. I mean, it, it makes no sense. It really doesn't. Welcome back. We're joined now by NBA champ Eddie House, founder of the big league, Jason McIntyre. Let's move to the NBA, where the hoopla over LeBron's decision to join the Lakers has calmed down. Hat on backwards. Oh, boy. Now <laughs> some people is. are starting to question LeBron's <laughs> motives for the move. Earlier this week, an anonymous player claimed LeBron chose Hollywood over the team. And now a guy who's not afraid to put his name on a quote, Charles Barkley, says he agrees, explaining, quote, I look at the move to L.A. strictly as a business decision. He's on the downside of his career, wants to be a big Hollywood mogul. He's going to be driving by the beach every day instead of going through the snow. Lakers are not even close to a top-tier team. They're a five, six seed in a best-case scenario. Whitlock, agree with Charles? Yeah, I really do, and, and that's not a, a huge shot at LeBron James. It's just a reading of the tea leaves of what's going on. He's out here about the Hollywood stuff. He's in Ohio about the educational stuff. Uh, the Lakers have assembled a bad team around him. He's gonna take the year off and focus on other things and maybe 
in 2019 slash 20, they'll make a real run at, at basketball again. But for the next, for this 12 month deal, it's about acclimating himself to Los Angeles and all that Hollywood has to offer. Oh boy, first of all, he's been in the mogul stage since he won in Cleveland. Okay, his first seven years in Cleveland was the show-off stage. Then he had to get some Grammys and titles. He did that in Miami. Then he came back and he won his second year in Cleveland. Last two or three years, he's been in the mogul stage. He's got production companies, movies, Blaze Pizza. No and, titles. By the way, those teams <laughs> were garbage. That's why he left. If his team was good in Cleveland, he wouldn't be in Los Angeles. And what does he have here? Well, he's got young players, doesn't tons of salary Love. cap. He doesn't ha he's not tied to horrible contracts in Cleveland. He's got less talent here, Colin. He's, he is, a, this idea that he moved to L.A., by the way, skiers, they moved to Colorado because that's where the slopes are. If you're a businessman, Kevin Durant liked tech. He moved to San Francisco. That was one of the reasons he went there, Silicon Valley. Is he a worse player? No, he's just got closer access to it. The guys that in tech world, they're at front row at Warriors games. Ke Kevin went there to, to develop code, is that what you're saying? <laughs> he went to, to develop code. Huh. <laughs> no, but I mean this idea that LeBron's going to be like driving to the game. No, I'm going to take a ride off the interstate. i got to stop over to Billionaire's house. Lamar Odom did it, didn't Well, Lamar Odom <laughs> doesn't have no, LeBron's Lamar was, discipline that's a emotionally. Yeah, that's a little different. <laughs> but to answer that question, no. Um, he, basketball is his top, top priority. And to, to your point of him taking a year off, there's no way he could take a year off. When you're the best player in the world, all other 29 teams are game planning for you. You cannot take a night off because they're game planning for you. And that'll be a harder ding on his legacy if he comes in and takes and kind of loafs through the season and his numbers all go down. I think that will be a, a bigger knock on his, on his legacy than him not him making the playoffs and maybe getting beaten the first round. He, I think he, he had... All right, let me say this. Go ahead. He's taking the summer off. Oh, he well, yeah, who cares? No, 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 no he's no, no, working no. out, though. I'm, I'm no, no, no. I'm talking about next summer, he's taking off. April, he'll be out of the playoffs very quickly, <laughs> and he'll have the whole summer off for the first time. Uh, yeah, I think we're being too harsh on LeBron here. His greatness is what got him all these doors open in Hollywood, right? It's allowed him to build a school in Akron. His basketball is leading to dinners with DiCaprio and all these superstars. If LeBron falls off a cliff here, oh, he's 34 years old and he's averaging 20 and he misses 30 games, is Hollywood going to be clamoring for LeBron James, who's not getting the Lakers anywhere? I think he knows basketball has to be Peyton, his top priority. Peyton Manning, his last six years in the league, was on every endorsement. He was on Saturday Night Live, and football demands six times the practice of the game. Basketball is not a practice sport for KD, for LeBron. There's no practice for these guys. He won't play in the preseason. He won't practice during the season after about January. Basketball is a lot of days off. Well, it, it depends is on who lot. your coach is. I played with Pat Riley. We had no days <laughs> off. You're right. <laughs> Zero. Luke but, Walton doesn't run as tight a ship, I believe. In but, LA. I mean, f Peyton Manning's last six years, he was on Saturday Night Live he once a month. He plays 16 games a year. LeBron plays 82. And, again, y'all are all exaggerating this like fall off that I'm predicting for LeBron. I'm that, not predicting a fall off of major proportions. I'm just saying the priority. What's your fall off? The, look, they're gonna, what Barkley said, five or six seed, and they'll bow out of the playoffs in the first round. All right. And LeBron will put up decent numbers, but he knows he's playing with Michael Beasley, Lance Stevenson, Ray John, right? They ain't winning nothing. Lonzo Ball, they're not winning nothing. It's not the priority. This year. I mean, it has to be the priority, though. You're not coming to just lose and just show up and say, hey, man, it's good that we just competed a little bit. I don't think that's in his makeup. I've talked to Rondo. I know it's definitely not in his makeup at all to say, hey, we just going to concede to the Golden State Warriors and give it to them. They're going to play as hard as they can. LeBron making a decision to come to L.A., it was kind of both. It was a basketball decision to come play for the Lakers, but then also on the back end to prepare for his future off the court. And, and so, so there's nothing wrong with multitasking and every and, and, and what did uh, Charles Barkley say something about uh, what, what, that it, it, it was a business decision to come to L.A. Yeah, well, every free agent is making business decisions. Paul George made a business decision to stay in OKC Here's to make more money. Here's what we're saying, Eddie, and everyone else. We're saying we agree with you. There's the business off the court stuff he wants to do and there's the basketball stuff he wants to do. What we're saying is what drove the decision was the off-the-court stuff, and the basketball was second. We're just saying the priorities have been flipped. That's a little jealous to me. I, I don't know if it, How's that jealous? Why is it just you, factual? Barkley 
I, we love Charles, but Charles moved to Phoenix and Houston. Charles, like, I can't believe these guys that moved. <laughs> I mean, Char I love Charles, but Charles... Ring moved. chasing for the final I mean, five years of his career. Of course he was. So it's like... A lot of the old school guys don't like the power, leverage, and mobility of new Why players. Why can't Barkley just be honest? It would be like someone said, you know, you know, they have salads at McDonald's now. Right, right. And so occasionally I'll get one. But I'm going for the double filet of fish sandwich. That's why I went. They make them <laughs> double filet of fish? Yes. I'm going for the double that's filet a of fish. Order. And I get the, the salad on the side. And that's all we're saying. This year, LeBron is out here on some Hollywood, DiCaprio, Al Pacino, let's kick it in L.A., let me build my school, you let do me do movies. It, that's what he's going for, how, and he's going to have a side of basketball. How is, Le no how is LeBron going <laughs> to no attract way. another free agent if they win 42 games? Because he's LeBron James, well, no, and he'll just say, look, man. He didn't attract none this year. No, no, my whole point is. By being is, LeBron James, he didn't attract none this year. Thank well, you, you got to win. Thank you. You gotta win. Yeah. You know what? You you eat the filet fish. You never do eat the salad. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. That's my point. That's his point. That's my point. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. Time for last call. Let's move to Le'Veon Bell, who still hasn't shown up at training camp, opting instead to party down in Miami, with TMZ posting some interesting video of him at a strip club. Kyle Heard, is the video a bad look? Le'Veon in a strip club, slapping booty. Not really. This is what young guys do. Young pro athletes at a strip club, I'm outraged by that. Seriously? I on think video? Does it got to be on video? Can anything be private now? And I know he was with his girl. He wasn't sneaking around or whatever, but does it have to be on video? You play for the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Rooney family. Well, you want to present I an don't, image that you're yeah, all about business? I, I don't always love his judgment. He's been busted twice. He's had issues. I think the bigger story was his coach called him out and said, I hope he comes in better shape than last year. Mike Tomlin, player guy, called out his star running back. Now, that is interesting. He wasn't working out in the strip club video. Uh, so I don't see him. Well, if the way in you make shape. it sound, his hand was slapping <laughs> something. He was some look, dexterity. I don't be, I'm not being a hypocrite. Look, everybody knows I, I'm not anti strip club, but you don't got to be on video when you're at the strip club, particularly when you're in a contract mode. You know, yeah. if I was in a contract mode, I would avoid strip clubs. 